Welcome to an episode in my tutorial about Linux drivers. So in today's video I want to introduce you to the device tree. So the device tree is a way of hardware detection which can be mostly found on embedded systems. But before we get into it, let's talk about how hardware detection is done on a normal x86 PC like your Intel or AMD laptop for example. So yeah, how does the hardware detection on x86 works? Well, there are different ways of doing so. So first we have a lot of discoverable buses like PCI, PCI Express or USB. So let me show you what I mean by discoverable buses. So here I am on my computer and if I run the command lspci, I can scan the PCI bus for available devices. And the way and these devices are accessible because every device has a unique vendor and a device ID. And if the system founds or reads this vendor and device ID, it knows at once which driver it needs for this device. And on USB it's basically the same. So if I run LS USB and list all the USB devices connected to my PC, you can also see every device has a unique vendor and device ID over which the device can be discovered and detected. And besides of detectable buses, there are also a lot of standardized addresses for x86. To name just a few examples, for example the address 3f8 to 3ff, over this address you can access the first serial port of your PC. Or behind address cf8 to cfc, you can access the PCI configuration space to read out which devices are available on the PCI bus. And there are a lot more standardized addresses for x86. In the video description I will put a link to a table which shows you some of the standardized addresses in x86. And for the remaining hardware which is not detectable and is not, cannot be found over standardized addresses, we have the BIOS or UEFI to provide information about the connected hardware through the Advanced Configuration and Power Interface ACPI. So this will tell us about the remaining devices of our system. But the problem is, these mechanisms are on standard x86 hardware, but they are not available on embedded systems. And therefore, they need another way for hardware detection, and the way the hardware detection is done, it is done over the device tree. But why, doesn't, why don't embedded systems use these um, mechanisms described here? Well, first, normally on embedded systems you have a so-called system on a chip. So you want to integrate your processor, but also most of your peripheral into one single chip. And on this chip you normally don't use PCI Express as an interconnect, but instead you have some other interface buses like AX, I or Ember available in embedded devices. And then there is a lot of variety of different vendors and different chip manufacturers out there for ARM hardware especially and everyone is using different IPs, so intellectual properties or hardware um, parts. So there is not just the same type of serial port like in x86, but in different chips you will have different serial ports. We will take a look at this later and normally also on embedded hardware you don't have a BIOS or UEFI, you only have a very small bootloader and that's basically it. So you need a quite lightweight way of hardware detection and this hardware detection is done through the device tree. Okay, so the device tree provides the Linux kernel the information about the available devices. And the devices are structured in a tree-based structure and each device is present as a device node. And the device tree um, is like, it, it's similar to a C application. So you have the source code form and you have a compiled binary. Similar to this you can compile your device tree sources, normally shortened with DTS and device tree source includes DTSI and they will be compiled to a DTB to a device tree binary. And if you want to take a look at the device tree, well the device tree is available behind the following addresses. So yeah, let's start with the Raspberry Pi first. So under slash proc um, device tree, you can find the device tree and also behind 
um, slash sys firmware device tree base sys firmware device tree base here you also have access to the device tree and the cool thing is so you can see we have a lot of folders in here but we can use the device tree compiler the DTC to convert this folder structure into a device tree source file and here we can see the command over this can be done so let me quit the presentation just for a second so I can copy out this command here um, okay let's do it this way so now I have saved the device tree source in temp dts.dt and if I open up this file here well we can see the device tree of my Raspberry Pi 3 so the device tree is in a tree based um, structure and here we have the root node of our device tree so this label up here gives us the version of the device tree we are running here then here this address cell and size cell is also important so this tells us how many 32 bit words are needed to describe the address of a device so in this case it's one 32 bit word and the size or for the telling us the size also one 32 bit word is used so here we can see some more information for example here the compatible string we'll talk about this just in a second but here for example we have a property called model so here we can see we are have a raspberry pi 3 model b plus revision 1.3 and here we have a lot of um, labels and aliases here. We can skip this for now. Quite a, quite a lot. <laughs> okay, but here now our device tree is basically starting and we can see our first devices. And I will jump a little bit more down here to the CPUs we have. So this note here will describe all the CPUs which are, avail are available on our device and it bundles them in the CPU device node. So regarding of the CPUs we have a CPU 0 here and if the, as the Raspberry Pi has a quad core CPU we can find four CPU nodes here in this device tree. And now let's talk a little bit about the various fields in this device tree node here. So compatible is very important because over this compatible property the link is done between the device tree and the driver which should be used for um, accessing the device. So for accessing the CPU free we want to use the driver of the compatible string ARM Cortex-A53. And normally this compatible string consists of the vendor of the hardware and the device name of the hardware. So here ARM is the vendor and Cortex-A53 is the device name here. Then we have various properties and you can see numbers are normally um, in this braces here. So what's also important here, yes this register entry is also interesting. So here over the rec property we are telling the address of the CPU in this regard and in this case the address is free and we can also find this address behind this at sign. So normally we have, first we have the um, node name of the device, then we have an at and then we have the address. But there are also some devices which don't provide an address. For example here we have a node for the level 2 cache 0 and here we don't have an address available and also no rec property. Okay, so let's go down a little bit. So here again we have some LEDs which are available. Here we have basically the activity LED and the power LED. Um, yep. Here memory is also quite important. So behind the memory node we can find our system memory. And here this memory um, is accessible over address 0. So this is the physical bus address behind which we can access the memory and here we can see the size of the memory and this is a little bit less than 512 megabytes which is the amount of memory available in the Raspberry Pi 3. Okay so now let's search for the serial port so I will type serial yep and here basically we can see our serial port 
And here again our compatible string, so this helper is also made from ARM and the device name is PL011, so a quite common word for ARM designs. This interrupt property here tells us the um, interrupt chip and the interrupt number. So when the IP triggers an interrupt, it will be forwarded to this interrupt number here. This register here again, we have here the physical address at the bus over which we can access the serial IP. And this argument is the size of the hardware cell. So this is 200 hexadecimal. And this status is also quite interesting because with the status property, we can enable or disable certain hardware in our chip. So for example, the serial port here is enabled, so the status is set to OK. But if we search for disable, yep, here this Bluetooth node is disabled, for example. So at the serial port, we have a Bluetooth chip connected. This is the name of the or yeah, vendor and device name. But here the status is disabled, so by default this Bluetooth device is disabled, for example. And we can check if we have more serial ports available. So let's search for serial again. Yep, so here we have one more serial port. Do we only have two serial ports here? Yep, it seems like we only have these two available here on this device tree. Okay. And just to give you a little bit of context, I'm also connected to a BeagleBorn Black here. And we can generate our device tree again with this command here. So here we are invoking the device tree compiler. The input format is from the file system. The output format should be device tree source. And here is the file or the folder from which the device tree starts. And this is our output file here. Okay, so yeah, we get a lot of warnings, but at the end we can read in our device tree. So let's take a look at this. So here the model is of course the TIM335X BeagleBone Green in this case. Then here we have a lot of strings and some labels. Yep, and here we have the CPU. And in this case on the BeagleBone Black we only have a single core CPU from the type Cortex-M8 and that's what we can see here. And maybe let's take a look at the memory which is available on the BeagleBone Black. So yeah, here we can see the memory node. And you can see the memory starts here at address 8400 hexadecimal. So it's a different memory location compared to our Raspberry Pi. And the size is also a little bit smaller. There should be only be 256 megabytes. Let's check. Oh no, it's also 500. Okay. Do we have a second memory node here? Or... <laughs> Sorry, but now I have to check. Um... So two, zero, 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 and four zeros. And now let's calculate it in. Okay, yep, that's 512 megabytes. Ah, and on the Raspberry Pi 3 we have one gigabyte and not 512 megabytes. Okay, sorry for this fuss here. <laughs> okay, so here we have the memory and now let's also search for the serial port. So in this case, the serial port is at this physical address. And you can see on the BeagleBone Black, a completely different type of serial port is used because now we're not using the ARM PL011 driver. No, we're using the TI AM3352UART driver instead. Or as a second option, the TI OMAP3UART driver. Yes, but again, the rest looks quite similar. We have status set to OK to enable the UART. We have our register property with the size of the IP. We have the number of our interrupt available. And yeah, that's basically it. And here we have even some configurations for a DMA. Yeah, so that was a short first introduction to the device tree. In the next video, I will show you how we can write our own first device tree overlay. Because one thing of the device tree is, if you want to add a device, one thing we could do is we could just add a device here give it any name, my device, and then, yeah, add the properties. 
but this would have the downside that we have to compile the whole device tree again. And with device tree overlays, we only change a little bit of the device tree and we don't have to compile the whole device tree again. And also on the Raspberry Pi and on some other embedded systems, you can apply this device tree overlay on the fly. But I will also show you how to do this in the next video. Okay, so that's it for today. I hope you've enjoyed the video and learned something. In case you want to support my work, you can buy me a coffee on buymeacoffee.com slash Linux. So thanks for watching and goodbye.